Welcome to another episode of the Straight Up Chicago Investor Podcast. I'm Tom Shellcross, licensed agent with Second City Real Estate. With me as always is Mark Ainley, founder and owner of GC Realty. Mark, back-to-back days recording. I'm feeling good over here. I am, I am. I think uh, recording these episodes is almost like a flow. So uh, it, almost down to like the things that we talk about. And uh, the more you and me talk, the more we actually have to banter about. So it's funny when you and me don't talk for a while, it, we actually have to think about what we want to banter about at the beginning of the show. So <laughs> um, it, the, it gets tough. Yeah, yeah. No, but you and me were talking about uh, earlier today about uh, the, uh, the budgeting for what people miss. And, and the, the funny thing is we, we were talking about that that last couple percent. I always refer to the last ten percent of uh, taking uh, as long as usually the first ninety percent of a rehab. But those those uh, that miscellaneous couple of thousand dollars you spend on the back end, whether it be the, the final punch list that you don't want to bring the contractor back out for, or or the door peephole that they, they forgot and it's not worth bringing them out there for one thing, or the the landscaping that all of a sudden now it's spring and then your yard looks like hell because there's snow on the ground before. Like to have that miscellaneous item uh, line item at the bottom of your your pro forma or your, your, your budget is, is so important and we're and, and making sure you work that in there. Cause otherwise that becomes a painful last couple thousand dollars. Yeah. If you're not accounting for it, and you're already over budget. And then, you know, you do all this work and the yard looks like crap. Like, come on, like you just, you're not setting yourself up for success there. And usually it's a lot of those cosmetic little things that are actually going to make the house sell faster or that it's going to, uh, um, you know, to help your place get, uh, you know, maybe a safety issue on the rental side or, or help it just have more curb appeal. And, and it's usually something that last couple of thousand dollars of that, that stuff you weren't thinking about or accounting for is usually the things that's actually going to make your life a hell of a lot easier. So to plan it in there, work down your numbers is it, I think it's ur- urgently urgent. So urgently urgent. I like it. urgently urgent. I didn't even David flow, but, uh, we'll, we'll roll with it. Not cut it. That's the, uh, thanks for calling me out. I appreciate it. Headline, the headline of the episode. <laughs> So no, it's just it's the same thing though. Just go through that little usability study, right? Do all the knobs work? Do the faucets work? Is the hot water on? Like all the little things that you know. One, you you were talking about cosmetic, but even just the tenant experience. They move in and like, oh, I don't have a key to this screen door or whatever it is, right? Like you just get off on the wrong foot. So do yeah, that yeah. exercise to make sure it's all it's all golden. Yeah, our clients get uh, frustrated sometimes where they'll do a rehab and they, maybe they're planning on selling it and now they're going to rent it out because for whatever reason, maybe they went over budget or maybe they can't sell for their the ARV they're gutting for, but they bring it to us and we might bring them a, a couple thousand dollar bill just because it's like, hey man, you kind of have to put some blinds on here. Or you kind of have to put uh, a, a, a railing here for your stairs or you, you have to put in the updated smoke detectors for that meet Illinois code. So some of these things, I, I think sometimes uh, those little tiny details on the rental side of things are things that the flippers are not not worried about so that, that's another place that i know some of the developers get frustrated with yeah good stuff what uh let's, let's keep the value going here what's the housing provider tip of the week yeah so i posted earlier today on uh Straight chicago uh, investor facebook club um a tip around you know pet screening you know I, I, you've heard me and i put a bunch of content out there around these scammer tenants lately but this has been going on for a while on the pet side of things where just these is people are going and buying uh, profiles and, and identities for, for applying for your place. People have been buying uh, the uh, comfort pets or buying the uh, um, uh, the pets that, uh, I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the words, but the pets that uh, we're not allowed to um, deny, service. service pets, service pets, and we're not allowed to um, uh, you know, charge for and all that stuff. And people pay 50 or hundred bucks for a certificate that, that was signed off by maybe even an official online doctor that, that, uh, that does this for a living in, uh, in some other country. But, um, th- there's, there's ways around that. And, and, you know, there's services, you know, I put in the post today, uh, pet screening.com is one of them for us. We use it's built into our software, find it. But, uh, what I posted on the Facebook group was basically an approval that came back for this pet meeting showing all the different criteria that these people uh met uh, and i also posted a picture of one that got denied where the, the other applicant you know clearly didn't have all their supporting evidence they need so i i know me as a landlord me as a property manager owner i get nervous sometimes right you're always worried about you're worried about pushing or questioning the wrong way or questioning the wrong person um or even questioning the wrong person and the wrong person using some uh law to uh take advantage of the situation so Having a third-party system such as like PetScreen.com or using the screening software, or using a property manager using the screening software, for that out there, is uh, one way to kind of reduce your risk or not let those tenants through that uh, should not have a pet or should be paying your pet rent or paying your pet fees, and, but they're using the laws uh, to get side by. Yeah, good stuff. And we'll, we can link to that one in the show notes. Yep. So I'm going to Facebook club too. All right. Hey, 
we got a heavy hitter. It has been a long time. This today's guest was uh, originally on episode fifty. I remember Sean New got us the introduction, and it was uh, we we're all excited because that was a big episode for us. Um, and for those who don't know, and I think most of you do, but he is a coach, he's an investor, he's a builder. He runs the Chicago RIA, which I believe is still the nation's largest RIA, uh, services over eight thousand investors. Uh, his mastery program has produced hundreds of successful students. I think we've had probably five or six of them on the show already. Uh, without further ado. Andrew Holmes, welcome back. Andrew, good to have you, man. We missed you. Thank you, guys. Uh, always a pleasure to be here. I have to say, you guys run one of the most professional and great value-added podcasts, man. Yeah, thanks. That means a lot. It wow. does. We do know it's a low bar, but we still appreciate it. We know where your sentiment is there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, hey, Andrew, like we're recording this just the beginning of March here. You just had one of your annual weekend events. Uh, talk to us about the three days. Do you know what... You know, is this the 20th, the 100th? Like, I know you've been doing this for a long time. Do you know which number this was? And just talk to our audience, how much work goes into putting that together? Uh, so this was uh, number 26. Okay. Um, and we started doing the three days the way we kind of do it uh, now back in 2012. So it's been uh, each year we do three of these. And um, we have about 650 or so people. Uh, 670 people uh, that are signed up for it, plus staff and so on and so forth. And uh, it's an event that's a local Chicago event. So 99% of people will be local Chicago investors that are either investing or have been doing it all the on t- uh, for a long time. And it's uh, I'm just kind of the circus monkey at the front of the circus. It's all it is. The tent and everybody else is what makes uh, the show. And for everybody that shows up, because at the end of the day, I can have 10 ideas, but if people don't absorb them, put it into practice, uh, it's really worthless. But I mean, it's a ton of work, but what is exciting to see is it's like a big family reunion for us, right? Because everybody comes, everybody shows up during the three-day period, and you get to see people who are almost like family members you've been investing uh, you know, alongside, and everybody's growing each three-day. People have more and more and more properties that have reached their goals, so it's, it's exciting. That, that's a lot of events. I mean, me and Tom are going on our, our fourth party next week. <laughs> it's not what you call it an event, but just just that is is, is crazy. So the work that you put into I just spent. Uh, we want to make sure we brought that to the surface of how, how how hard you guys work to help provide that value to all of your uh, your, your community. But so going back to 2012, like what what's different now than it was back then? And 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 you know we all look back five years and we always want a better version. It's like what's a better version now than it was back then? I think uh, it's a different style of challenges we're facing back at that time. I started uh, buying flips 2008 uh, when everybody was running for the hills, so I couldn't have picked a worse day. Uh, but 2008 through 12, in 12, we didn't know it at the time. But at that time, we were kind of the values were starting to kind of turn around, right? Um, and uh, more and more people were jumping in gradually. When you're in the middle of storm or coming out of it, you don't realize it. You look back and you're like, oh, that was the kind of the wrap up of that whole thing. And then things have gotten better from then. But a big difference from an investment standpoint is we didn't have all the big hedge funds, hard money, quote unquote lenders that were that are in the space today. Much easier to borrow money today than it was at that time. Um, people want to say, oh my God, the market is not good because suddenly people are not buying. I mean, inventory was huge, right? Really massive if you're in the middle of it. There were a lot of properties to buy today. Uh, are there more deals than there were a year ago? For sure. But still, uh, I think we're way better off today than we were at that time. I, I just throw it out there, and I know you've probably heard stories like this, but you know, in 2009, we started buying these properties, and I thought, you know what, we'll, we'll buy these uh, cash, these properties with some borrowed cash and, uh, and, and be able to take it to any bank in the world and, and cash out these, no problem. And my first cash out for my first 10 properties was uh, 12% interest, 12.9 and like eight points because I, I started at one bank, went to a broker, went to a broker and everyone had a piece of it. And it was a, a year term. And, and I think, uh, I lost, uh, first child out of that too. But, uh, yeah, people like don't realize how easy lending is these last five, six years compared to what it just was non-existent. Uh, back it was, it was a man. I talked about that. I called 36 banks in 2011 to find one bank. Uh, at the time, it was a 25-year AM uh, portfolio loan, five-year balloon. Uh, and I was scared to death because people are like, oh my God, you're buying these properties. 
Oh, what if it doesn't work out? And uh, the plan was to pay them down in a hurry. I mean, for, I'm very fortunate that that conservative approach worked, but it was crazy. It was hard to find banks. Yeah. So, Andrew, you have earned, you know, everything you've accomplished. I want, I want to be very clear to our listeners here. Like, you have earned. You have, you have scrounged and grinded, and, like, this story is just amazing. Um, I don't want to recap it all on this show because it's been covered numerous times. And for those who don't know Andrew, go back to episode 50, go back to YouTube. You can find a lot of different... You know, the background, the story of how he got to where he is today. But let's take it from the last time you were on the show, 18 months ago. You know, we were kind of in the middle of the pandemic to now, right? Besides, you know, flying planes and, and doing all the fun things you like to do. At a high level, what, what else have you been up to? What, what has changed since, you know, we last talked to you 18 months ago? So, um, seems like it's been ages, but, uh, you know, it's been only 18 months. So, uh, we'll start at the pandemic. So, at that time, basically... Um, the main business that I had personally was owning a lot of single family and two to four flat properties, right? Uh, and uh, at that time, maybe I was somewhere around at 85, 86,000 a month in terms of cash flow, net cash flow after expenses. Today, that's up to about close to 120,000 a month, right? And business wise, what has changed is that uh, basically at the time, uh, I added obviously more properties, but the big changes were we started Florida. We started building. I was looking for another market like Chicago. I'm a Chicago investor, meaning um, I started in the suburbs. I believe, I don't care what anybody says, Chicago is one of the best places if you know what you're doing, which is critical and goes back to what you guys add with your show, is people don't understand the Chicago market, right? Uh, everybody thinks about crime when they should come think about Chicago and they think about tall buildings. They don't understand we're one of the big premier markets because... There are not too many places where still you can pick up a property at the price you can pick it up for. Relative rents are very high. And so your net cash flows are super, super, super high in Chicago. And you can get own good quality real estate. So I've stuck to that goal, but I wanted to add another market. And so we started doing new construction for duplexes, triplexes, and single families to hold as a rental portfolio, Airbnbs and midterms in the Florida market. So we have at this point about uh, 90 properties that are coming out of the ground. The first couple are already up and running on Airbnb. And uh, in the Chicago market, we added a bunch of uh, Airbnbs in the suburbs as well as midterm rentals. And the numbers are absolutely phenomenal. What markets in Florida are you playing in? Specifically Charlotte County, Florida. I wanted, a, I'm a believer in a bread and butter market. Uh, meaning B market, solid B market. I don't want to be in an A market because it's too expensive. I don't want to be in the uh, C or D market. I want to be bread and butter market. So everybody that moves from Chicago goes and rents a property in Florida or is living there six months out of the year. I wanted to be the guy who owned all the properties that they basically rented, right? So that's kind of the market. Gotcha. So for our listeners, that's uh, just uh, north of like Fort Myers in, in- that's just north of Fort Myers, south of uh, Sarasota, right? The middle pocket right in between. But how long have you been thinking about that? Like, was this just an idea that came up? Was this something that had been on your mind for a few years? Because it's a pretty big pivot, right? To go find the right, you have to find the right contractors, the right team. Talk to just like the original you know, ideation. So I've been always against 100% against new construction living in Chicago, right? I've been against any... Uh, second story additions. I've been against any square footage additions. I mean, I was one, and a lot of people are like, oh, Andrew's crazy, which is fine. Um, because to me, the rate of return for doing that much work is not enough. There's other easier ways to make money. You should do that. When I got to Florida, I wanted to buy exact similar properties that we were buying here. That was the sweet spot. Three twos, three ones, three one and a half for Florida ranches, basically. The problem was the market was too hot. And I wanted to be, I didn't want to go buy one property in Florida. I said, how can I do a hundred? How can I do 200? And then if I'm going to do it, all the people that are part of the community here uh, in Mastery, I wanted to bring them along. And uh, so I basically literally, this had been on my mind, but I didn't know how to execute it. I was like, if I can find a similar market, I can duplicate it in a market with favorable taxes, the advantages that we see, you know, in a more, a Florida type of state, but I couldn't find anything in volume and I didn't want it to take as long as it took 
in Chicago for me to build up to scale 100, 200, 300 properties. And so what I did was I sent our guy who handled construction in Chicago. I'm like, hey, man, take my car. He's like, where am I going? I'm like, just go to Florida. He's like, why? I'm like, I'll tell you when you get there. Like, literally, I told him, go check into a hotel, any hotel, 90 miles north of Tampa, and start driving east, stay away five miles from the ocean, right? Uh, and then go back, you know, back and forth and back and forth. And we call that area selection. What I was trying to get him to do was every property that was on the market and that had sold in the last six months, I made him over a three-week period go through each county by county by county. We skipped Tampa because I felt Tampa was too hot, skipped Sarasota because I felt it was too hot. I wanted a hot market, and right next to it is where I've always believed you should buy, next to a crazy hot market, because everybody goes and overpays in a hot market. And we finally... Uh, went all the way down to Fort Myers. Naples obviously was out of the question. Um, so, and we realized there was a sweet little pocket in the middle, which was kind of a boring county. And that was Charlotte County at the time. And the reason I picked that was because I could build up a huge inventory of duplexes, number one, number two, triplexes, and number three, single families. And in that order, uh, because we could scale up because the land was already divided, so you already have lots that are all divided. They all are zoned. All you do is buy the lot, get a survey done, get a topo done, submit it. I mean, literally 60 days from the time you buy it, you're ready to build. Got it. So you're doing this in, in scale. Talk to us about, you know, the first started without the systems in place. What are some of the things like playing Monday morning quarterback you would do differently? Right, I'm sure it's gone smoothly. Like we've seen the success stories. I've seen them posted on social media. Uh, but just being critical of, you know, what are some things you would done differently? You know, uh, so we got there, when we got there, we were, it was kind of the hottest market that we have seen in the last two, three years. And in Florida, what we didn't realize was, I mean, you couldn't get trusses, you couldn't get block, you couldn't get concrete, you couldn't get anything. We could buy the land, was land was plenty at that time. Uh, but uh, the problem we were running into was any engineer even willing to do a survey six months out, right? Mm -hmm. And so we went through, I mean, as you would imagine, every single person that was building down the street, we went to talk to them. We figured out, okay, who's building. So some of those trials and tribulations to the extent that literally we brought in windows from uh, 1,300 miles away, impact windows that we needed for Florida because nobody would sell it to them. I mean, nobody would sell it to us. So we had to basically uh, go up to Massachusetts, pick up windows, have it put on a uh, trailer and basically haul them down there. Same thing with trusses. We uh, never knew that we would have to buy a, literally a 18-wheeler truck and the trailer um, and pay for uh, coverage for crossing three states to bring trusses all the way from North Carolina. Now we are able to source this locally. Same thing with windows. So, you know, every single thing that you can imagine that could have gone wrong, it's like with any other project, and you would think that you would try one. I basically promoted the idea to a whole bunch of people, and literally, um, I had bought about maybe 10 or 12 lots, and then 35 of us show up in this relatively small county, um, and literally every agent in town, he hmm. thought that the people from Chicago had lost their mind because we were all looking for duplexes in a weekend the price of a duplex lot went from twenty two, twenty three thousand to forty five to fifty thousand in a weekend. And people would meet you. They're like, "Oh my God, have you met those people from Chicago?" We're like, "No, no, we are those." Right? It was the funniest thing. But the exciting thing is this: today, on every other street, we have properties coming out, and either I own one or somebody that is an investor from Chicago that we're all friends with. Right? They're part of mastery. And so, and every one of them looks the same. So it's kind of exciting from that perspective. You gotta get a Chicago flag in the front yard, man. Let, no, we're to, man. let everyone know. We're, we're going to know. I mean, it's like, we want to be the biggest, you know, biggest investors as a group of us. And the exciting thing is this, it's not like a lot of times it's like, well, look what I built. Here, look, look what we all can achieve as a group, right? Just because you build 10, there's no shortage for me and we can all grow. I mean, that sense of camaraderie um, of, uh, going down there, going for dinners. It, it's a lifestyle, right? I mean, it, which I never saw that coming today. 
But you did something similar here in in specific suburbs where you, you kind of clustered uh, your groups and you guys would have hundreds of properties in, in, in the uh, city. And you're doing that down there. What are the benefits of that? Uh, I mean, outside of the camaraderie, what are the benefits for the community? Like, talk to us about kind of your, your, what you're adding uh, to, to do it. So you know what the benefits are? Number one, uh, it's once the, the cities or towns realize uh, what are the, you know, that we do things right. We pull permits. We do it by the book. Um, the other thing is that you know the pool of tenants. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. Lansing, before we got there, which is literally almost Indiana next to almost Indiana, you know, is the last city before you get to Indiana. When we started buying properties there, pricing was around 40000 50000 for a three-bedroom, two-bedroom type of a property. And today, you can't touch a property less than 140 150 on the buy side. Forget about on the rehab side. But it had a great tenant mix, great town, uh, crime rate was right. It had all the marks of making for a great town. And all of us as investors going in there and putting long-term tenants, like we put in two, three, four-year tenants and we screen really hard. So you're literally bringing up the town. You're not just basically putting people who are going to be abusive for the whole thing. I mean, in Lansing, there are about 400 properties today, almost 396 or so properties that are owned purely on a mastery. It's a small town, right? If you take Streamwood, you take, now we're buying Schaumburg. There's so many towns like that that are around bread and butter places where we have so many of these properties. So we, as a group of investors, make a difference in bringing up the quality and the values. And used to be, it used to take six months to sell a property in, um, uh, you know, in Lansing, and it went down to two days. 16 of us would have an offer on the same damn property. So it was kind of exciting. So, so what I'm hearing though is in order to make that type of volume uh, be good, you have to be an awesome operator. Oh, 100%. You guys are adding value by being awesome operators and yeah. you're able to fly above the radar and use the word permits. And like, th there's no, there's no shortcuts. You, you guys are doing it right. And, and you're, you're uh, trying to be leaders by example. And that's where the, the true benefit comes from. It's not if you're shitty, it, 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 you're, you're modeled to the work. Yeah, no, no, I mean, we, we don't buy properties in areas that have too many challenges, right? I mean, to me, challenging people do challenge the things and they live in too many challenging areas, right? And I, we can't change the economics of an area, but we can certainly take an area which has good basic features and take it to the next level. And we've seen that happen. And I mean, Glenwood is one of those, Lansing is one of those, uh, Linwood, uh, we bought a lot of properties and, um, individual investors are making a huge difference. And to kind of take it a step forward, um, you know, we win, which is a kind of a sister organization for us, uh, basically women um, uh, investors, they started doing during Corona fund drives during food giveaways. And the towns really appreciated that. They're like, hey, you guys are not just quote unquote investors. You guys are working towards the goodwill of the community, right? And it's a small act. I mean, for all of us to raise a little bit of money and go give out five, six, eight hundred, um, whatever food baskets or whatever it was at the time, uh, it didn't make any difference for us. But yet, everybody coming and volunteering is not the greedy investor as sometimes the city officials may look at it. Yeah, no, that's great. Even that's great. Even simpler than that, just showing up, right? You sh show up to like the board meeting, whatever it is. Just you know, I I'm a human being. Here I am, right? Yeah, and they've taken it a step further. And by they, you know, you mentioned we win. Uh, you know, we've had both Gina Diaz and uh, Fair Ali on the podcast. Uh, Fair has got her best selling book out there. Like two great examples of people crushing it over there. Episode yeah. sixty two. Oh, look at you pulling out data. Nice work. <laughs> so, so Andrew, we we before we started talking about Florida, you mentioned you were going down there, and that you guys were also experiencing, you know, the mid term and short term rentals. Talk to us about why the pivot there. And how is that going? Let's 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 go down that uh that thread here. So um so as we talk about like midterm and short term rentals first, let's just so short term rentals everybody's familiar with, right? The big website obviously being Airbnb, VRBO for vacations, so on and so forth. You have furnish binders, you have hot pads for pilots, and for anybody that's listening to this, if you own a property close to O'Hare, um, especially two flat, three flat, four flat, you want to buy it. Look up a website. It's called Hot Pads uh, website, or just put airline pilots. Um, you know, and you have air hostesses, and not, not today they're called what? 
uh, whatever the right political term is for Stewardess. people, yeah, stewardesses or stewards, whatever that term is, you guys get my point. Um, and pilots, they come to O'Hare for training. And so they're based out of here for six months at a time. So they're here for a week, gone home, come back for a week. And so, and I did not uh, know this, but we have a lot of um, pilots and uh, aerospace in mastery. And they're like, hey, why do, aren't you guys doing that? Which is you can literally take a two unit, three unit, four unit building and rent the uh, bunk beds, buy the bunk bed. And these are professional people. So these are not people that are going to come and trash your place. And you can do a hot bed or a cold bed. And I'm not going to be exact accurate. People can do a little bit of research and look this up. And you can literally make four or five hundred dollars. And uh, I think hotbed is when you uh, rent it out for the uh, for the month, and you're charging four or five hundred dollars per bed. So one bedroom can have four bunk beds because these guys are coming at their particular time. So you have the left corner bunk that's assigned to Captain Bob, and Captain Bob has it for the next six months. That sort of thing. And the cash flow on these is incredible with professional tenants because they're coming here only for work. So you don't have parties, you don't have any of that kind of nonsense. I don't know if you guys have ever discussed that. I just thought I'd throw it out there. We have it. Let's talk about it. Yeah, no, the first thing I think about is uh, Seinfeld episode with the drawers with uh, Kramer where he rents to the Japanese business people. Like, that's the first thing I think of when you started going down the hot, 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 hot. So yeah, what are I mean, some things? What are some things you might need to consider? Like you, you have to have internet access. I'm assuming like that's like, what are some of the, you know, some of the other things that uh, if you're only used to doing long-term tenants, that you need to wrap your head around? So, I mean, a couple of things, like we'll just finish this particular thing we're talking about for pilots, stewardesses, that sort of thing. So number one, you obviously, even if you're in Chicago, uh, you got to be by O'Hare. Midway doesn't have that. This is for O'Hare we're specifically talking about. Um, and so, because they come for training, they come for various things. Um, and that's when they uh, basically rent these uh, from you. So you just need to have some sort of an access back and forth. Uh, if there's a bus, train, whatever, the better access you have, the more people that you will get. And there are a bunch of examples of that if people just go on the website um, so that they can kind of track uh, track it out. Now, if we switch over to, um, so when we talk about short-term rentals, most of the time people think about uh, what I like to call it as an exotic rental versus a boring rental. To me, I like to do boring short-term rentals, meaning these are rentals that are going to be in places uh, that are the average suburbs, right, um, of uh, of Chicago. And these are everyday bread and butter houses. There's nothing fancy about them. You're fixing them up to a little bit nicer level, obviously, fit and finish, of closer to a flip fit and finish, and you are uh, furnishing them. The furniture uh, generally is anywhere from 8000 to 15000 most of it's coming from Amazon and website type of stuff. So nothing fancy furniture, but you're just putting it together with the uh, plates, cups, whatever somebody would need to stay in the house for four days, five days a week, a month, that sort of thing, right? And in that, there's two categories. You have the short term, which is anything less than 30 days. If you have 30 days or more, it becomes a midterm. So a lot of the towns around Chicago don't allow short term but they'll allow midterms. And so the way I look at it is for every property, so I underwrite all of these as I want minimum of five to $700 net cash flow after expenses, PIPI, on all properties. That's how I look at it. So if I'm going to make five to 700 per property on a regular long-term, long-term for me is two to three year rental, not a year rental. So if I'm going to make that, then if I convert it to a, um, Airbnb, then it's going to be about 2000 a month net after all expenses, including cleaning, including management. If it's a midterm, midterm, I prefer more than short term because I think midterm, you have less people moving in and out. People are staying there 30 days, 45 days, uh, you know, 60 days and they're paying. I mean, what is mind blowing is that in an, in a suburb where the average rent, I'll give you an example or two property out in Western suburbs that I could rent all day long, about $3,100, $3,200 uh, in today's market uh, on a midterm uh, rental um, on four, 30 days, 45 days, they're paying $5,500 a month. It's nuts. It's nuts. I mean, it's just unbelievable. 
and there's so much demand for it that it's it's just amazing what people will pay. And these are very stable, good people. And a lot of times they're coming here for businesses. Uh, they're coming here for different things, and their company is paying for it. Three, four people, and it's it's incredible. Yeah. What are um. I guess, how do you look at a property and underwrite that? Like if you have someone from mastery saying, I want to implement this strategy, are you saying like, Hey, you got to make sure it still works as a long-term, it just, has just in case long-term. it has to work as a long-term. If it's yep. not a good quality property for long-term, then, uh, I think you're playing with five. Yeah. Cause yeah. if you, I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Melrose park. Uh, I was putting up a property there. I knew they do not allow. Uh, Airbnb beats, or I, I should just rephrase that. I never asked, right? So, <laughs> but I mean, I had heard about it. Of course, I get a call from um, the mayor's office. They're like, "Hey, Andrew, you of all people, uh, what are you doing?" The neighbor complained, blah blah. Now, mind you, we had already furnished it, um, and I mean, for no reason, I ended up wasting money getting all the furniture assembled, uh, moving the furniture. It's okay for me. If it's a new investor. That can put a hurting on you. Or you, if your plan is, hey, I need $2,800 a month to be able to just make payments on this house. And now the city suddenly goes and bans that particular, uh, you know, Airbnbs. Well, you're out of luck, right? So you have to check with the codes, uh, with the towns. And some of these, they have draconian fines. So you, I think it's better to play within the rules and make a lot of money rather than try to basically just uh, have issues. Yeah, Naperville has uh, it's like a seven hundred fifty dollar per day yeah. when they catch you uh, yeah. doing short term stuff. Yeah, and when you say short term, go ahead, Andrew. So in Barrington specifically, somebody took uh, that had a ongoing um, Airbnb. They took them to court and they lost. Now you have um, case law that supports all the towns, and they're going to win. I mean, you're not going to be able to beat them uh, on that ordinance. So. Um, I think there are ways around it and it's better. The more all of us play nice, I think it'll be better for all of us. Otherwise, the time towns are going to shut everybody down. They'll make it worse for everybody. Yeah. Yep. And are you still, you, we're talking about short term, but if you're doing 30 days or more, are you pretty much abiding by the rules in, in most, most or all of the suburbs and villages? Most villages allow it. That's the beauty of it is that most villages allow it. So when you're doing 30 or more, you're well within the rules. Right, Roselle being a perfect example, because they reached out to me and they're like, uh, and I I know the lady there, and she's like, Andrew, what are you doing? I'm getting a heat, I'm a lot of heat. I'm like, here's proof. She's like, okay, great, no problem. Got it. And then, how are you marketing to find that that tenant? Right, you want to make the you know, the, let's say the numbers work long term, but I, I think I can be more profitable doing you know mid term, getting people for thirty to forty five days, like the example you gave earlier. How do you go market that? Who, who do you who do you reach it out to? How are you how do you reposition that property? You're basically putting it on uh, uh, Airbnb, on uh, Furnish Finders, and uh, on VRBO. Okay, that's, and just saying, hey, you have to have a minimum day. It. I'm sorry. And just saying, you have to have this minimum stay. Correct. Correct. Got it. Yeah. Ideally, at some point, and we haven't gotten to that point yet. Ideally, you're renting these out to people who have lost their houses. Uh, insurance type of things, fires, flood, I mean, or somebody's pipe burst, those type of things. So a lot of times what you see around the country, people who've been doing this for a a little while is that they develop a kind of a group of insurance companies locally, uh, insurance providers that will reach out to them and they don't even have to go through any of these um, kind of websites, that sort of thing. So you can get around it. And there's a lot of people that have successfully built really good businesses where 70 or 80% of their bookings come directly to their website rather than going through one of these uh, types of sites. Wow, that's beautiful. That's easy. And then do, uh, can you share what is like an Airbnb take off the top? Like what's their cut of your rent? Um, oh, you know, because they take it off the top, I don't remember off the bat, but there is a difference. Like let's just say you're getting 250 uh, a day for your um, for a four day stay, it's two fifty each day. Plus there's a cleaning fee. Plus there's a Airbnb fee and they pick X amount off. I don't remember the exact amount, but if you're going to do a 30 day, what you have to be careful about is generally for Airbnb, if you use a management company, there's a lot of great ones, local ones, 
uh, some of the ones that are kind of national, that type of thing. Generally, the number is 20%. That Airbnb takes their take, and then the management company will take 20% off the top. Um, and then you get the rest. If they're doing um, a midterm, then um, anywhere from 10% to 15%, because they don't have that many touches. You don't have that many cleanings. So you save a lot on cleaning fees. So you're doing one cleaning and you're good to go. And you're only providing enough, say, toilet paper, enough basic necessities for a week. And then if the person is staying, the guest is staying there for the next 45 days, 60 days, they got some properties, they're staying 60 days, 90 days, and then they're just buying their own toiletries and, you know, the basic stuff. Man, it sounds so simple. No, it is It is simple, uh, you know, but it's not simple to get it set up. Once you have it set up, it's a pain to get it set up because, like, my biggest problem is I don't have the time, neither the propensity to go to these houses. So I'm relying on people, staff to do all of this stuff and to get them trained to think about it from this perspective. It's, uh, you know, one thing extra we started doing with uh, all the Airbnbs, all the midterm rentals, which we did not do with our long-term rentals was every property we're getting a line, a camera run through scope all the way to the sewer and rot it out completely. Because with the tenant, it's like, oh, well, it's backed up. Oh, we're so sorry, blah, blah. Within first couple of days, you can fix it. With this sort of a thing, it needs to be just right. You got to get the washer running, the dryer running, uh, all those issues ironed out before you put a guest there, because otherwise you're going to end up with a bad review and you die, live and die by those reviews. Yeah, I was just, just going to ask about that. Like, as a housing provider, you know, you know, if a tenant doesn't like you, they move out, you know, you, you, re, you regroup and you say, okay, here's where we messed up and you get the next one in and you try to do better. With this though, like you've lost, you've lost leverage. The tenant has some leverage there, or this the person's well, I mean, staying I there a, because uh, they have the review, the review that can kill you. The review, and I mean again, and you don't want that, right? It's a hospital. We're doing. See, we're in the real estate business. Now you're going in the hospitality business. Suddenly, these are two different businesses, and I want nothing to do with management of hospitality, right? Because I buy real estate, and I want to own real estate for long periods of time. This just becomes an additional way where you can really boost up your revenues. Um, both as real estate investor and both as management. I mean, there's a huge market, huge market, and you can make unbelievable money literally doing management for Airbnbs. If you, if you have the aptitude to do that, God bless. I don't. But anybody who does have the aptitude, you can do really well. But then you have to have that service-oriented personality. You have to be on top of it. You have to deal with sometimes some people. I mean, generally in the areas we're in, we generally don't get difficult people. Uh, but I had an incident where brand new property, I mean, like brand new rehab, property up and running, everything is great. And uh, the guest comes and stays there. And one day comes back from dinner and the the whole line is backed up. And to the extent that on the lower level, the sewage had come and he comes down the stairs and he just boom, falls, right? It's one of those things. Uh, no. Nobody wants that at their property. Uh, fortunately, we uh, he asked for a refund. We gave him a full refund for the week. Um, and then we got it cleaned out. It was just kind of one of those things that I learned my lesson there. I'm like, hey, guys, let's just be, I'd rather spend a couple hundred dollars extra on the front end and make sure it's right rather than go back and then have an issue like this. What, what is, uh, this is a newer uh, part of the industry in the last, call it 20 years, but... What, what, when is uh, a market too saturated or when, when is it become too saturated or when is there too much uh, supply and end up man uh, around short or midterm? What, what's your thoughts on that? I think you have to kind of play it by ear where, uh, I mean, there are pockets where uh, you see that the occupancies are really low, right? I mean, the two, most people know about um, AirDNA, which is the big website for looking up statistics and all that kind of stuff. There's another one, Mashwiser. Some people like Mashwiser. I like Mashwiser because if you have a subscription, they'll let you download the occupancy rates uh, in places. But you have to take it with a grain of salt. The best way I personally feel is that you go into Air, 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 Airbnb, keep all your dates open, you know, put one or two guests, whatever category you're going to be in, and then just look at what is the rotation. And then if you look at uh, a lot of other people that have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 reviews, and the review dates are 
back to back to back to back to back. What that means is that clearly they're getting a lot of guests, right? If you see long breaks in that, then that means they're not getting as many guests, right? And they're going to have to lower that. So that's kind of what it is. But generally, and it's what's interesting is this, you would think if you take a suburb like, say, Oswego, you take a suburb like uh, like Romeoville, you take some of the far out, out suburbs that who the heck is going to go live there? And they're killing it. I mean, it's, it's just the most unbelievable thing. Now, we're talking about it. You guys have a huge impact uh, in terms of a lot of investors you guys use. Um, and uh, But we're going to see that. The market will change in the next two, three uh, years. Um, that it will, I mean, like, let's just say you're in Downers Grove. You, you talk about this, oh my God, I'm doing great, I'm doing great. Well, next year, another 15 of them come up, you may not be doing so great, right? Hence, you have to be kind of flexible uh, and financially have the wherewithal to be able to do that. Yeah. One, one more question before we roll into the next topic here. You know, talk about the acquisition side, right? Because if I'm buying a long-term rental, I'm looking at what is my purchase, what is my rehab, what is the ARV, I pull my cash out, and then what does it cash flow for, right? Like it's pretty simple, proven formula. And I know you're saying, hey, you got to look at these things long-term, but on the acquisition side, are you looking at, you know, it, what's different than when you're looking at these sort of properties compared to what you've been doing over the last decade? So what I did was for specifically the midterm and the Airbnb model, I switched. I was buying B properties, B meaning I'd buy Streamwood, Hanover Park versus uh, Schaumburg because Schaumburg being an A, right? Uh, I would consider uh, Streamwood and more bread and butter compared to Schaumburg. So now I'm buying all A properties personally for me. I'm not talking about now a lot of people within the RIA, within Mastery Group, they're buying still B properties just financially where you are. But I'm buying across the board all A areas because now I can acquire properties at 240, 250, 260. Um, I'm, I can fix it up for 40 or 50, uh, 60,000, and the back end values are in the 400s. And my rentals are working out because the rents have gone through the roof. I mean, that's another equation that the Delta, I mean, the weirdest thing has happened, which is at one time, if I was all in a property in Schaumburg at uh, 250, I didn't get enough rents to support my numbers, which is I wanted to be in for 25, 30% equity in it. I wanted 500 bucks net cash flow after all expenses. And um, I wanted a DCR of 1.33. Those are the three criteria we use. I couldn't do it then. Today, when the prices are actually higher. Now it works. <laughs> it's the of, I mean, it's the craziest thing ever. And the interest rates are higher, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's so interesting how the market has changed. And that I think today the market is more nuanced than it was back in 2008 through 15. I mean, maybe you guys will have any comments on that. But it's today, it's, you have to have a little bit more intellect, but you can make a lot more money. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. You know, so I play in the north side of Chicago, and it's the same convo I have where you almost have to do this rehab or these guts or these big, you know big lifts because the money you put in the project, yes, you're putting more in, but you get it back on the back end, and then the rents go up at an amplified rate. It's the same concept you're saying where now you can buy at a higher rate, but the rents have gone up so much that it, it, it the numbers now work where they didn't from the get go. So same mindset there. I mean, so, it's, a lot of times I'm like, I have to look back at my numbers. I'm like, am I sane? Does this really make sense, right? You're like, you're doubting yourself. I'm like, man, I've been doing this for a long time. But you're like, this makes no sense. I mean, I'm buying a property for 210 a great bungalow in a great A area. I'm fixing a 60, 70 of a brand new property. Appraisal comes back 410 I can't sell it at 410 mind you. I can maximum, I can sell it as a 380 maybe in today's market, right? But yet... My all in cost is three, I mean, 260, 280, somewhere in there. But cash flows like no tomorrow on a regular cash, I mean, a regular long term. On midterm, it's through the roof. And you're like, this is just crazy. I mean, this just doesn't add up. So, but it's, it's, it, it's interesting time. Yeah. So let, let's talk about rates, right? Because that's another one that plays in here. Because when we, we last spoke, rates were probably in the threes, right? So I'm sure, you know, the end of last year, everyone, everyone gets spooked. You know, what were you saying to your mastery students and, and what's been the message since rates have gone up? To me, I mean, in fact, today and a couple hours, we're doing a, a, one of the live broadcasts and it's called uh, Prayers for High Interest Rates. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean and I'm uh, 
see, the problem is this, man. When when the rate, we obviously in a perfect world, you want lots of inventory to buy great properties, low rates, make money hand over fist. Want it all? Is, I mean, come on, right? So if your rates are low, there's going to be too many people buying, right? Uh, if the rates are high, that's going to quash the inventory because of the amount of money was printed. Everybody jumped into real estate. I'm actually happy that they're keeping the rates high because it discourages homeowners from buying properties, right? Because they are not simply not going to qualify. And on the other side of it is a lot of amateur investors. Uh, they don't know or they're too scared. And to me, you make money whenever something there is something wrong in the market. It hadn't been not for 2008, I would have not been able to get it real estate, right? And you, and like today, there's a lot of chaos in the market or there's perceived chaos or whatever it is. I like it because now is the time to really focus, to button down. And I always feel whenever everybody's buying, do crazy flips, overpriced properties, dump them, right? I mean, I'm you, and in today's market, you buy, 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 just be careful as long as you're not overpaying, right? That's the biggest issue because you got to be able to underwrite these files. I'm not afraid of, I mean, hopefully it's again within reason, but the rates we have right now, I'm totally fine with. Yeah, and even I don't know if you guys looked into like the commercial side, but you know when you get out of Freddie and Fannie commercial, you know we locked in a six unit at five eight seven five. Yeah, it's March first right now. Yeah, right, like that's not insane. Yeah, it's not much higher than what it was We're a year. We all commercials because with that many properties owned, we can't uh, be on the Freddie side of it. So we're all it's all commercial loans we're doing, and it is what it is. I think it discourages people. I think the more upheaval there is politically, all this kind of stuff it gives us margins to be able to pick up properties. And we're buying good quality properties more than I have ever bought. So it's it's just weird. Yeah, there's, it, it's, it, it depends on who you talk to too, right? Like it's funny going to these meetups and hearing how everyone, I'm either sitting on the sideline or, oh, I've bought seven things in the last two months. <laughs> so Andrew, what does the next five years look like for you and the group and, and where you guys are going? So we're doubling down I and mean, we're doubling down in terms of uh, midterms, Airbnbs, for sure. Florida is a hundred percent go in terms of, um, we're going to build as much as we can and get it, uh, you know, rented out, uh, or Airbnb, whatever the case is. Again, it needs to be underwritten based on basic principles of investing, right? A lot of times I think people get too exuberant about it. Um, so for the Airbnb strategy in Illinois. The way I'm doing it is that I want my basis, meaning my ownership basis, in terms of a loan to be down. So I'll give you a perfect example. If I buy a property for, say, two, 200, I put 60 into it, property appraises for 400. I don't consider that property at 400, 410. I look at what is realistic on a conservative appraisal. So let's just say 360. My cost in the property is somewhere around, say, 270, 280. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the extra money that is coming in from Airbnbs or be it short term, and I'm getting that uh, loan down below about 225, 200 ideally. Then I can sit on the property forever. If they ever completely stop midterms, they completely stop Airbnbs, my basis in it will be so low compared to everybody else on the street that I never go backwards. My belief has always been I'm much better off having this much but have a solid foundation rather than grow this big and then have something come and basically wipe me out, if that makes any sense. No, it does. So, go ahead, Mark. I would say it makes complete sense. And, and, and you've been preaching this for a decade now about uh, a lot of people would just call it conservative, but the whole principal pay down. And, and uh, I know I, I've been doing that uh, with, with my personal residents and, and it just, uh, just get more so just in case. I'm not a big believer in it uh, sometimes when it comes to leverage, but for my personal residents, I've been doing it and to watch it go down as fast as it does, like it, 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 it's amazing how much uh, you're saving over time with that or you're able to put somewhere else down the road with that. Yeah, th there's that and the, the other point to it is, you know, like, like he was saying, if you go down and you're at a 200 basis and let's say, you know, Everything hits the fan. If you if you absolutely needed to, needed to, you can refi that back out in a thirty year, right? And like that payment is so low. Like yeah. that thing will cash flow. It'll cash flow, right? Like that was the first thought I had. Like when when the pandemic first hit, all my stuff. I was like, okay, well, how low could I potentially get these payments if I had to? Yeah. The stuff that was the least scary to me was the stuff I've owned the longest because it yeah. had been paid down the most. 
Man, you know, nowadays we live in the era of obviously YouTube and TikTok. I'm a believer of the whole Warren Buffett and the Charlie Munger style of investing, which you do good, prudent things for long periods of time, you're going to be great, right? Uh, and I really believe in that. I embrace, and I always have. Maybe, uh, you know, I'm not worth 100 million, but 50 is okay, man. I mean, I can live with 50 million, but at least I don't have to ever lose sleep. And I truly believe that you have to be prudent. The basic investing principles, uh, you can never basically, uh, you can do things fast, you can leverage up, but if you are foolish in the long run, it's going to come back to bite. I mean, I'm still old school in that way. No, oh, it's not old school. That's just good business. Yeah, it's just fundamentally sound, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, Mark, you ready to wrap this? Yeah, totally. Now, the cool thing about a high-flying, fast-thinking entrepreneur is we could ask the same five, six questions, and you probably don't remember your answer last time, but you'll give an awesome answer this time. So, uh, outside of the one of what you do for fun, you need something other than flying. But uh, what is your guys' competitive advantage? How, well, just as a group, how is your group able to accomplish so much? when so many other groups out there like have just been uh, bluffed? I think it's access to the right information. There's a lot of information out there, but you have to know who to go to and who's real. So it's not just content, it's context that you put the content in. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> so Andrew, you offer a lot of advice, but what is the one piece of advice you would tell someone that is yet to buy their first property in the Chicagoland area? I think the devil is in the details. Because if you could just buy low and sell high, everybody would be a multimillionaire real estate. The devil is in the details. I like it. All right. All right. What do you do for fun these days? Man, it hasn't changed. Hiking and flying. Those are the All two right. things. <laughs> I dig it. We'll let you add another. So give us either a good book, a good podcast, or a self-development activity that you would recommend to our listeners. So, um, I think, I mean, obviously they're listening to your podcast. I mean, and I genuinely meant this when you guys, uh, when in, initially we were talking about this, you guys, what you've done with the podcast and the value you guys bring is absolutely tremendous, right? But, uh, the one book I would recommend, you said this, uh, for Oz book for people who are especially beginners and even people who have been in the business, uh, is that a uh, book is the diaries of female investor. Um, because what she has accomplished following some very simple yet uh, long, you know, proven, prudent business principles, starting where she started to where she is today, right? I mean, literally the woman has close to 40,000 net cash flow coming in a month, every single month, right? With the 50 houses, it's incredible. What is, and you don't have to do a lot of properties. You can have a smaller portfolio relatively, and you can be incredibly profitable. Bigger is not always better. Yeah. No, it's a great book. We'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, Farrah was on episode 62, so it uh, wasn't, much, wasn't much after when we originally had you on. Uh, and it's a great book. It gives, uh, my favorite part is it gives the actual numbers, right? Yeah. It says, I bought it for this. I like, it's very tangible as opposed to like, hey, I went from rags to riches. Like, right. it, it's got all the actual meat in, in there for you. All right. Besides yourself, Name one person in your local network you'd recommend to other Chicago real estate investors. I mean, I think uh, you got right? Um, uh, to me, uh, I think what this is all about is, be it me, be it anybody else, is that you have to find key people that are actually doing stuff. I mean, you'd be much better off to, um, if you look at a, say, a, you know, kind of a YouTube video, you listen to a podcast, try to find somebody local, number one and then figure out what do they actually do rather than what they talk about. Yeah. If they actually run a business, right? If they actually do something, you can actually tangibly look at what they do. That is what is duplicatable. It's very easy to say, but to do it in real life is not, is not quite the same. All right, we'll accept that answer too. There's a lot, <laughs> a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of preachers out there, not too many doers. <laughs> so It's only getting worse with chat GPT. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Andrew, thank you so much. You provide a ton of value to our listeners. How can they learn more about you? Is there any way they can provide value to you? Man, I mean, uh, come out, join. If uh, there's, uh, we're, again, starting a podcast, right? If your listeners have any great uh, thought leaders in the real estate industry that are real, we would love to 
uh, be able to connect with them. And uh, they can always uh, go to chicagoria.com. That's Chicago, R-E-I-A dot com. And uh, we're, our job is to serve. That if somebody shows up around us, hopefully if we don't make a positive impact, we'll fail. Right? So, um, you know, because you should make friends with people that you can learn from, teach, profit with, or enjoy being around. If there's no four things, then there's no reason to be friends. Like, awesome. So, Mark, we have our Chicago fact here. Who are we playing for? All right, we're playing for you know, Tiffany Jones out of Oak Park bought a t-shirt back in uh, June. So, Tiffany, if we get this, if myself or Andrew gets the Chicago fact right, we'll send you out a $50 Amazon gift card as part of your winnings. Sponsored by Renovo. We appreciate our sponsorship there. Yes. Even though Mark might have forgotten. All right, so, and Andrew, I'll give you a shout out this one as well. Mark, it's first, first at bat, though. And this is according to 2020, so it's a little bit dated. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the Chicago Ria. You have just an awesome complex out there in Lombard. So, Mark, who is Lombard's top employer? I'll give you, I'll give you some options. Is it the school district? School District 87. Is it adjustable forms? Is it the Weston, so the mall out there? Or J.C. Penny? Um, I will go with uh, School District 87. Andrew, what are you going with? I think I'm going with the same thing. So you guys might be right, but in 2020, it was still J.C. Penny. I haven't, we don't have the updated stats on how, how much they've been hit since then. Wow. So they got to have like some giant office out there that I don't know, right? Because they're not headquartered there. Yeah, no, I headquartered. I mean, they have a giant store. I had no idea they had this kind of, but they must have some sort of office building or something here. Yeah, sneaky. I, I'm so sorry. I, uh, I, I, I screwed our listener there with a backdoor question. Uh, Tiffany Jones, because Tom sucks at picking questions, we're still going to send you out the $50 <laughs> gift card. We're not going to be cheap by new, and especially because it's brought to you by Renovo and, and they, they want to send it to you too. So, uh, Andrew, thanks for coming back, man. Awesome episode, Tom. Uh, thank you as always. Listeners, check out uh, Real Estate Investment, uh, Real Estate Investor Meetup page on Straight Up Chicago Investor. You, you'll find Andrew's group on there as well, too. Uh, they got tons of events. We got tons of other events, and there's lots. I, I made uh, Shay from my office put together a networking calendar, and he's got uh, stuff he's going to every single week for like the next 10 weeks. I apologize to his pregnant wife, but uh, um, check it out. Uh, Andrew, thank you. Tom, thank you. Listeners, we'll see you next week. Thanks all. Thanks, guys.